in the house. Let's go. What's up, man? Fired up to see you. Oh, no, I'm always, always excited to be back. Like, Nashville's a hidden gem I didn't know about, really. I, I think this is my third or fourth time. But every time I come down, it's fun. You walk around, listen to music. I, mean, I had no idea how many people that I knew on social media actually live here. Yeah. yeah. So many people are coming from the East Coast and the West Coast right. to where there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration. Yes. Which is nice as Nashville continues to grow because yeah. as you know in our space it's always great to learn right. from someone mm -hmm. and it's always great to share a stage with someone. That's just it. I, I was in yesterday and I got to bump into two people that I know independently and then they happen to be in the same place at the same time. I'm like this is working out beautifully. Yeah. So yeah. Cool. Um, well let's jump right into it brother. Sure. Um, I'm glad you're in Nashville. We've got a great event today. Yes. Follow up from the Impact Effect 23 conference last year. Um, speaking of impact, mm -hmm. how do you define impact in today's world? So impact for me is what is something that's not a rah-rah, what's something that actually changes someone to some degree. And what I mean by that is it can be a thought, it can be an action, but it's just motivation is fleeting. So I don't think you make an, an impact with motivation. I think when you give people tactical information that they can utilize, I don't care if it's health, nutrition, business, relationships, you name it. When it's not something that just makes you feel good, but when you can change your life, that's an impact to me. Yeah, totally, man. How do you live a life of impact? So there's a few different ones. Um, we've all heard of hope, which is help out one person every day. What I try and do is when somebody pops to mind, I send them a text. And it doesn't matter if it's in passing, I just somebody's head pops to my mind. And if they respond back, it's a bonus. But the big question is not just, hey, what's going on with me, but what's going on with you? So a, a very simple question, because I would always <laughs> stick my foot in my mouth. I'd be like, hey, how's the new job going? And they're like, yeah, I got fired last Friday. I'm like, hey, hey, how's your new relationship? Yeah, we broke up a month ago. I'm like, <laughs> all right, so I quit asking specifics. And now I'm just a very generic, like, hey, what's new in your world? And then people can share good things, bad things, you name it. But that's what I do is I just randomly reach out to people. Because yeah. you never know, what if you're the one person that reached out when they needed somebody to talk to? And so too often people reach out because, oh, I need something now. Why not just reach out when somebody pops to mind? Well, I think, and this is why I think we're such good friends, is mm -hmm. because this leads into building authentic, real relationships. Yes. Right? Is And you're taking action immediately. Mm -hmm. Someone pops into your head, you're asking an open-ended question right. to start and engage a conversation that's not about you. Exactly. And what you need and what you want. Right. It's more so about them. And to your point with asking a question or checking in on someone when they need it, I mean, there's been times where I'm someone pops into my head, I send a message and you know, someone was thinking about taking their life. Exactly. And it's an, it's just a oh hey, no no one asks me this question. No one asks how's things. No one asks, mm -hmm. you know, this or that and who knows how powerful that can be. 100% uh, I just recently did a, a a training for a corporation, one of the things we're talking about is they're mainly Zoom now. Well, people miss face-to-face -face communication like this. Well, so if there's white under somebody's pupils, that means they're under stress. So if you're seeing that repetitively on someone's Zoom, all you can ask somebody is, hey, how are you doing? That's it. Not you look sick or anything. Don't try and project what you're thinking. Yes. Just, hey, how are you doing? What if that's that conversation, like you said, that saves their life? What if they feel stuck at home, alone, isolated, and they're thinking, maybe I don't need to be around anymore? So when there's physical things on the body that we can see, somebody's frowning all the time. I mean, you can go into so many different things, but I'll look. And if I see that white under the eyes, then I know they're under stress. And why not just ask the question? That's So t tell me more about the white under the eyes, because sure. I, I, didn't, I didn't know this, oh, yeah. uh, th this Brian Galkey <laughs> trick. You yeah. know, yeah, I've, been, I've been studying you. You did some one-on-one -on -one stuff with me, but I didn't know about this one. Yeah, so I, I did... There's all kinds of things in the book. So everything that I learned, I was taught by attorneys, how to understand people based on their facial features. Been yeah. around since the Greeks, based on physiognomy. The first thing everybody's going to say is, oh, it's a pseudoscience. It is because a pseudoscience is something that doesn't meet the scientific method every time. Yep. Doesn't mean it can't work. Guess what? You can't prove that body language is exactly the same. Crossed arms doesn't always mean you're mad or you're angry. It can mean your back hurts. That's how you're more comfortable. Your shoulder hurts. I got, you know, you name it. can it. be comfort for some yes, people. exactly. Not a majority, but some. Yes. Yeah. But everybody picks up like a body language book and goes, crossed arms is bad. No, it's not. And that's the thing. When you read good body language books like our friend Janine yeah. or Joe Navarro, other people, 
It says you look for a baseline and then you pay attention to changes. Well, our faces are the exact same way. So um, I teach law enforcement also. And there's three things about the eyes. If there's white under the eyes, you can think they're under stress. Okay. So if you see white under like this, then you go, you can go, hey, how, how do I look? You're fine right okay. now. Are you sure? I'll let you know. All yeah. right, all right, all right, all right. Um, yeah. But yeah, you can, when you see people on Zoom, I love body language, but how effective is that on Zoom right now? It's True. not. So then I'm looking for other things. Now, if there's white above their eyes, they're over their limit. That's the first thing that we teach the law enforcement. Like if they're on patrol and they're going to be pulling someone over and they see the whites above the eyes, that's potential violence. Wow. I taught that at a school system as well. Why? Because coaches and teachers need to know when is a student getting ready to get physical or a parent when they come in because look, we all become Papa Bear, Mama Bear when it's our kid. Of course. And so you have to know what's a sign. Now, we know when they start gritting their teeth, their nostrils start flaring, uh, the jaws start pumping, that's yeah, potential yeah. violence. Yeah. But the first sign is white above the eyes. Wow. So that's how you know, am I physically in danger? So there's white above the eyes, they're over their limit. Something bad's about to happen. White under their eyes, they're under stress. So you need to ask, hey, how are you doing? And then you see this all the time, especially I was walking around in Nashville. A lot of homeless people, if you see white all the way around the eyes, like their eyes not connected to the rest, they're disconnected mentally. So when you see that, that's when you kind of want to stay away from that person because you don't know what reality they're living in. Exactly. So they're going to go left or yes. right or come out of nowhere. Yeah. or like So there, there was a very, the last two days at the, the hotel I'm staying at, there was a Starbucks there. And twice homeless people came in and one guy walked in yesterday and they said, John, you know you're not allowed in here. And he walked over and he slammed something and said, F-U-B. And I was sitting here thinking, is this about to be a fight situation? And I looked at his eyes and he's just disconnected in here. Wow. Another guy came in today and you can, there was something about his gait when he walked in. I'm like, this isn't good. And he just walked bad in. energy? Yeah, bad energy walking in the room. And I thought, this isn't good. And sure enough, same thing. He's, I, you guys just don't, and just started yelling and freaking out. And you just look and you see the white all the way around their eyes. And it's just people live in a different reality. Wow. So um, there, and there's some misconceptions too. Sometimes if, a, if somebody's eyelid is down, it's covering half their eye. They've mentally withdrawn, but that's not always a bad thing. Athletes do it all the time. So if you see an athlete and they're sitting on the bench and they're like this, a lot of times they're not in watching the game that's going on. They're mentally preparing for the next step in the game. Yeah. So totally, totally. Yeah. Interesting. So, okay. Yeah. All right. I'm going to be paying attention to the under eye under oh, stress. Yeah. Yes. Under the eyes are under stress. So if you see the whites under their eyes, you just think they're under stress. Yep. Whites above the eyes, they're over their limit. You need to back off. Create some space between you and them. Yeah. And then if it's all the way around, they're just mentally disconnected. Wow. Yeah. And you can see... Now, now let me ask you this, because mm -hmm. I know you do a lot of work from sales and leadership and all that with businesses and entrepreneurs. What about a photo? Because a photo could be a previous sure. time. That's right. So, uh, and one of the things we're going to talk about today is that's why I start on LinkedIn. And because you, you come from the real estate background... Uh, executives and realtors are the worst about updating their LinkedIn profile because yeah. they had their professional headshots done and it could have been a decade ago. Yeah. <laughs> so not only are they physically older, but depending on what the artist did that took it, the photographer, they may have inverted the image. Mm. So you don't know, am I looking at, because we've talked about it in the class, there's a personal side and a professional side. So I need to know which side am I talking to. And I don't know if the photographer inverted that image or not. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So that's why I start on LinkedIn, but then I go to social media or I start in a company's about us page. Then I go stalk them on Google or something else. Yeah. Find almost the, the progression of what they actually yes. naturally would look like. Yes. Because it's where our faces are constantly changing. There's 43 muscles in the face. Mind creates movement. Movement creates muscles. So, you know, cause you've seen the presentation. I show a picture of me at 18 versus 38, how much it's changed. Now it doesn't have to be 20 years difference. It can be, you're in a horrible relationship, a horrible work situation, then you leave and you start smiling. All of a sudden you go from having a frown or downturn mouth to having an upturn mouth. And people go, you look like a new person. You do. Yeah. That's why we say that, friends. Wow. Yeah. Powerful. Yes. It's like those little miracle moments that we always pass by in life. Mm -hmm. And when someone says that, it's almost like, oh, and then we move on. But if we actually sit back and reflect and think about what that comment may mean, Yes. You probably will find the similarities of those changes consecutively over time. You will. And the, wow. We're just not taught. So it used to be part of the academic system. So it goes all the way back to Aristotle, the Greeks. It was in the education system until Henry VIII said, I don't like the idea that beggars and vagabonds can use this against their fellow man. And he had it yanked out of academia. 
Wow. This used to be taught to everyone. And the only th- way that it stayed kind of in the mainstream was authors and artists took courses in it to learn how to do character development. So if you think about books, there were men and women, women wore dresses, men wore suits. But the only two ways to describe the characters in the books were through their actions and through their facial features. Or wow. we watch modern TV. What is Spock? Spock is all logic. What does he have? A straight eyebrow. Just one. So TV, movies, books, uh, fairy tale books, everything have told us a little bit about each other. But we just haven't been formally trained on it. Yeah. yeah. Can't identify it. We, yeah. haven't, we, haven't pra- we haven't spent enough time with you. Exactly. <laughs> and, and I didn't develop it. That's the funny thing. It's people are like, oh, well, you just came up. With-. I'm like, no, it's been around for a very long time. It's taught in some law schools for jury consulting. That's how my mentor found it is he was an attorney, he learned it for jury consulting, it's like, this has worldwide applications, and he walked away from law and taught this all around the world. Wow. You brought up something interesting, how it was removed from academia and society. Mm -hmm. What I've realized, some of the best education or strategy or concept almost teeters that fine line of manipulation and positive influence. Correct really depends on who's utilizing it and how, right? And that can be said with curiosity, sales, questions, facial features, micro expressions, all of it. How do you use it for positive influence and how do you teach it specifically? Sure. For me, it's about learning to understand other people, not judgment, not anything else. I'm an introvert by nature. So when I'm focused on you, I'm not thinking about me. And that's what really took me to this. There are two things that... I was instantly hooked and you've heard my story, but I actually went to go prove that the guy that taught me and became my mentor was a fraud because a friend came into town. We were supposed to go to dinner. She's like, I'm not going to make it to dinner now. So come meet this guy. I'm like, why do I need to come meet this guy? She goes, Oh, he reads faces. I'm like, this is a bunch of, can I pass? Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, this is a bunch of bullshit. I've never heard of this. Talking to the guy from Boston. (laughs) There's no filters around here. Um, So you were a mass hole, (laughs) 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 but I was instantly hooked because was, and by the way, before you tell the rest of the story, yeah. one conversation away from changing the trajectory of your life exactly is this relationship. Yeah, I didn't go searching this out. Had my friend not come to town, had she not invited me to meet this guy, my life, I don't, I'd probably still be in corporate America. And, but when I met him, I was on the help desk. Why? Because as a good introvert, I liked careers that people had to come to me. I was a bouncer. I waited tables. I worked retail. I did Al Bundy like lady shoes. Thought it was going to be the best job on earth? No, that is not. <laughs> that was a horrible job. Uh, but yeah, I always make jobs that people had to come to me. Like when I was a bartender, this is my bar. I'm a badass behind this bar. Yeah. Get me on the other side of the bar. I'm like, hi, can I get a drink? Yeah. <laughs> so, Please, the, the, the person in line when everybody to your left gets one and, yes. and everybody to your right, you're, you're like, open. I guess I'm not going to drink tonight. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah, um, but it, that one interaction changed my life. But it was because... Even though I was skeptical, I was curious. Yeah. And that's what I think also people miss out on. You ask the question, how can it be used for good or evil? Well, a knife can cut my dinner or I can stab somebody with it. Yeah. It's the intent behind the user, not the tool itself. Yep. And so that's what's funny about it is people go, oh, it's manipulation. I go, okay, do you travel? They're like, yeah. I go, what happens if they don't speak English in that country? Well, do you speak English louder? Does that work for you? No. You learn, you try and speak their language, then they'll try and speak yours. That's all this is. Yeah. There is no manipulation. I don't somehow say words and wallets fall out, you know, or money or anything like that. But it's about not being a narcissist and thinking the, the problem is we've been told our the entire life that live by the golden rule, treat people the way you want to be treated. But what if you don't want to be treated like me? So the real rule is treat people the way they want to be treated. And our faces tell us a little bit about how to speak your language. So important because... And I think that's, you know, in my journey personally, where I'm at in business and mm-hmm. life, that's such an important concept. It's yes. something that I've grabbed and held on to recently mm-hmm. because, you know, I've just always thought that people think some to some degree like me. Mm-hmm. And when I change a marketing messaging or I change copyright or I have a conversation with someone and, and this is why I love relationships and yeah. I think everything will come back to relationships since I'm the relationship 100%. guy. Yeah. Um, but when you actually engage in a good, detailed, honest, true conversation with mm-hmm. someone, you build a relationship with them and you acquire new information, it allows me to try new strategies of communication mm-hmm. in marketing 
because it's re that information was received differently or is interpreted. Right. Same product, same offer, same service, mm -hmm. different way to communicate it, and all of a sudden this offer blows up and I sell a ton of it. Yes. Whereas this is the same product, the same service, the same bonuses, the same all of it. Yeah. I like to give bonuses, as right. you, we all know. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't attract because it doesn't connect. Correct. And the art of human connection is something that I'm just... I'm like so nerding out right now on. I've read five books in the last two weeks and mm -hmm. I'm reading every study and going down all these social, just all these rabbit holes. But it, it really comes back to the art of communication, the art of human connection, mm -hmm. all is aligned with what that energy transfer is like. Yes. And also what lens and perspective mm -hmm. is being spoken to. Right. And we need to understand someone before we communicate or provide specific messaging around it to have a greater good and that that benefit to them and to me right Agreed. well that's why you read any book book yourself solid um be seen you name it what's the first thing i tell you is if, before you start anything you have to know who your avatar is and you have to try and understand who is it that i want to speak to now i'll tell you something that was a pithy for me later on relationships aren't <coughs> always having a conversation sometimes a relationship can just be sharing something personal to let other people know that they're not alone. So it doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one direct contact. One of the most engaging posts I ever got was talking about being fired and what was life like a year afterwards. Because there's a lot of shame of being fired, getting divorced, whatever. It's a phase in life, you know? And how many people are going through that? That's exactly it. And But people are afraid to say it because on social media, we're only supposed to put our best things forward and life is always grand. And I tell people, like, I still financially struggle at times because... I made really good money with golden handcuffs at a corporation where I hated every day, but now I love life. It's just learning to grow this business. And I have to step back and remember, okay, how much did I make my first year when I started in corporate America, right? So there's that <laughs> weird level setting that goes yeah. with it. But the more authentic you are, the more people will align with you. And totally. again, it doesn't have to be me reaching out to you one-on-one. -on -one. It can be saying something that even you and I are having conversation. The other people watching may hear something go, I'm not alone in that. That's well, it's, I, I mean, that's it, they're now saying that the number one cause of death is loneliness. Absolutely. There's enough studies. Mm -hmm. This is why I'm, I'm just so deep into relationships because at the end of the day, a study just came out that says if you are lonely and you're over 60 years old, mm -hmm. the effect that it has on your body and your heart and your mind yes. is similar to the effect that smoking 15 cigarettes a day has on your lungs. Yes. So it's literally in parallel to smoking cigarettes and getting cancer, loneliness, right. as, a, as a sickness right. or a cause of death. Well, that's why... That to me is nuts. It is. That's nuts. It, the problem is purpose. And what we're mistakenly taught is my purpose is my career. No, your purpose is so, so much more than a job that you fill for a temporary period of time. But we were raised, go to school, get a job, retire, die. So if you look at mortality, Retire, rates, that's pretty much it, right? <laughs> look, so if you look, There's no really, fun after retirement, no, no. people. You heard it from Brian. You retire <laughs> and you fucking kick it right that's after. It. You're dead. Look at the studies. <laughs> like People will retire and they lose their identity. That's why if they don't become a, a golf marshal at a golf course or find something to do, their health deteriorates on a sliding scale. Well, what do you live for? That's what I mean. So that's I tell yeah. people all the time. I'm like, I, mean, I said this while I was in corporate America. You need to have a hobby or a part-time job. Because if you're clinging on to one thing, no one person can make your life. No one position can make your life. But we're taught that it can. Oh, my God, I'm getting divorced. You know how horrible that means it? And a great study I heard, I don't remember, or a great quote I heard, not a study, was there is no such thing as divorce. You're either single or you're married. Divorce is a temporary title that why are you wearing it like a moniker or like the scarlet letter? Yeah. You're either single or you're married. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or you can throw engaged in there. But divorced was a one-time event that's over. So you're either single or you're married. Yeah. And I liked that because we try and put these permanent labels on temporary things. Well, all we're the trying time. to package it based on what society tells yes. us, not necessarily where the truth lies. Exactly. And I think that's the biggest thing in today's world where we're going sideways a little bit is, mm -hmm. and we talked about it, like, are you an influencer or are you a thought leader? There's a major difference there. Absolutely. Are you just trying to influence someone to buy a product? Yeah. Or are you bringing deep knowledge and education an actual concept and study to someone 
to then use for a benefit of themselves. Right. Right? Like those are two massively different things. The big shift that I've seen over the years is it used to be that the only speakers were either formal political uh, officials or athletes. Well, great. You were good at football. How does that help me? Yeah. Now, what you see with modern speakers are, this is how I got into the Olympics. This was my training regimen. These are the things I had to do differently. So we've gone away from the impressive rah-rah yes. to the tactical, how can you learn from what I went through? And we all love to hear a good story, but that's fleeting. And that's what I'm seeing the big change is, are you providing people with tactical information that they can use and put into their life? Or are you telling them a story to feel good? And don't get me wrong, the feel-good stories are good from time to time. Like that's why we all watch movies and TV, yeah. right? It's a temporary Everything escape. Is a story. But what I'm seeing is there's less butts and seats if there's not tactical information. Yeah. So I think too, it's the concept of people remember how you feel, mm -hmm. not what you said or how or whatever, right? Like yeah. totally agree with that. But to your point, I think that it can't just be all feels. Yes. Because someone's gonna we talked about motivation to start this. That's motivating, yeah. Yeah. right? So like, yeah, I'll remember that because that person motivated me to go take action. Mm -hmm. But that's not enough. Right. Because now you can go to YouTube for motivation. Now you can get on a free webinar. Now you can watch this. You can read that. And it still has the same effect. But how do I actually use it that lines up with what I need and what I'm seeking and how to benefit my business or my life? Right. And once you mirror the two, and this this has been my journey with speaking. Mm -hmm. You know, I've only been doing it for a year and a half, but I started speaking with no emotion because that was the phase that I was in in life. Mm -hmm. And that no emotion gave tactical things, but it was more of teaching. Yes. So it was tough to get on a stage where I didn't know anybody Mm -hmm. And just come out and start dropping all these nuggets because I was teaching. So I had to warm up the audience a little bit just to build that relationship, right? And you talked about, and this is a great concept because you said it earlier, building a relationship doesn't need to be back and forth in that conversation. So I do need to say something mm -hmm. that creates relatability, mm -hmm. that shows a little vulnerability and a level of intelligence and a little bit of personality, right? Mm -hmm. So you can get to kind of know me whether you like me or not, but at least trust me so there's a story and a path and there's a level of intelligence. But then drop a lot of nuggets yes. so they can actually take that now that they're connected and then make the connection back to their business mm -hmm. and then remind them as I exit the speech on how that made them feel right. and the actual next steps to go implement. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the best way to do it mm -hmm. Now you're talking from a guy who hasn't been doing it that long, so I could be completely wrong here and my speaking career could absolutely bomb next week. <laughs> but based on the comments, based on the engagement, based on interviewing, based on watching successful folks that speak and getting the feedback from those people right after, yes, it comes back to that path. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I'd love to hear your opinion on this, knowing you've done this a lot longer than I have. So uh, a few things, like you were on my podcast, right? And I've seen you on other podcasts too. I guarantee you more people know the fact that you shared sitting at the kitchen table going, oh shit. And you sharing the fact of your wife saying, I would do this with you anywhere. People will remember that more than what, what you shared on the podcast. True. So not to say you don't have good information, Yeah. but who hasn't been sitting at that table with life decisions going, oh fuck, where do we go from here? Yeah. And not everybody had that support like you did, but that's what a lot of people are going to remember. One totally. of my favorite pictures from Impact Effect 23 is you bring your wife and your daughter up there because you didn't make it about you. You made it about the crew that made it all possible. Yeah. You know, and that's when you, you're starting to see that a little bit more. Um, I've been to a few events with Brad and others where, you know, he brings up his wife and his kids and other things. You didn't used to see that. Yeah. Before it was about like, I'm a badass. Come look at me, learn from me, buy my stuff, but I'm not real. And I think when, as people are starting to show who they really are, that's where you find your audience. Totally. Totally. You know? And yeah. it, it's, it's important to me to where I need to involve them. Yes. Because it is tough. You know this lifestyle oh, absolutely. that we live, right? Yeah. It's not, nothing's guaranteed. Right. Trends change. Yes. You're traveling a ton. You're unemployed after every talk. You're unemployed after every talk. <laughs> right. Fuck, man. You just hit me right there, dude. Like, That's a steep talk sin. about vulnerability, man. Yeah. I had, you know, 
Ooh, that hits. Yeah. That's one that Steve Sims taught me. Like, like there's, it's you're unemployed after every gig. So yeah. you, there's, but there's an important part of that. One, that way you have an incentive to, to give good information. Yes. Because if you were, if somebody booked you for a year's worth of speaking, you'd half-ass show up. But when you know this speech leads to my future meals, you give to the, to the people, right? Versus just show up and collect a paycheck. Yeah. And the other part about it goes back to relationships. If you do a good job and now somebody has an, a vacant spot for next year, you can go, hey, you know what? Uh, thank you for having me. And, you know, if they say, do you know anybody else? I go, well, I have my friend Jim Morris, who I think would be really good for your stage. So, like, for example, when I, every time I've come to visit you, I'm like, hey, do you know this person? Do you know this person? Do you mind if I bring him? Because I want you to meet more people. What do I get out of it? Nothing that I see. Two good people maybe make a connection out of it. Of course. And, but that's not how everybody thinks. Some people yeah. think, all right, where's my next gig? What am I going to get next? Instead of what's good for the group? You said two important things there. And, and if you're listening, this is going to be very important when I ask this question to Brian in a second because he is great at building relationships. And he does this and he shows up and he owns the responsibility of the relationship. That's one thing that I admire about you. Um, you know, I'm a relationship person. I may be hot one week and catching up with you mm -hmm. and then going to travel and I, and we don't talk, but you own the responsibility. You follow up, mm -hmm. you ask questions. If I, if I miss a text, you're not like, Oh, Jim didn't text me back. You'll follow up or you'll, you'll throw something else at me to grab my attention and, and yeah. you own responsibility of the relationship. And I think that's the number one problem in building relationships. Mm -hmm is, and my wife just recently did this, and I was like, oh, I wanna coach you, but this is not gonna work out well, and it's not that big of a deal. But like, she was like, oh, well, I really wanna hang out with this person, and they didn't get back to me, they're probably busy, but and she started making up the story about That's that. exactly what I was gonna say. And I was gonna say, to take the responsibility, you wanna go hang out with them, you wanna do the, the, the date. Right. And um, I think we need to do that more often, because we're, we're creating a story that's potentially not real. Exactly. That person can literally just miss a text message and, and not even know and think the same thing that you're thinking. Yes. Oh, they didn't text me. But then, because text like, I don't know about you, but it's like, those things get lost like freaking popcorn at the movie theater, dude. Yes. Um, so owning that responsibility. But back to the question I wanted to ask you, you, um, you were talking about relationships mm -hmm. and you know, Janine Driver, right? Like how we got introduced right. and, you know, you making those connections and she made that connection for you back to me. And, and, and it's just this beautiful thing because there's true compassion right? and there's true honesty and vulnerability when you say, no, you've got to meet Brian, you've got to talk to Brian, or you've got to, Jim, you've got to talk to this person or this person's going to come to your event and, because you're putting your name on the line. Correct. So when someone of your stature says, hey, check out this person or, or I want to introduce you, it's important to me. Yes. Because I know it's validated. I know you're not doing it for anything, right. number one. There's not an alternative motive, right. which I think is number two in problems with relationships. Mm -hmm. is we, and it goes back, we talked about vulnerability. Being vulnerable to get something isn't vulnerability. Correct. And I used to do that shit. Oh. Oh, this will be a good post. This will be, um, this sucks in my life. I was playing victim. Mm -hmm. Let me post about it. Well, 182 likes. I'm like, no. When I actually pour it out and don't give a shit about the likes, the followers or anything, yes. and I'm just doing it and sometimes for a, a release for me. Yeah. A stress release for me, mm -hmm. right? Like, let me get this off my chest. I got to tell someone. Right. That's when it has the biggest impact and allows to build the relationship. So anyways, I want to go back to Janine Driver. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about how you built the relationship with Janine and where you, what are you guys doing now in 2024? Sure. And how do you continue to put yourself in those types of situations where you have raving fans? So the funny thing about Janine is it's that seven degrees of Kevin Bacon type thing. So it would have to go back to... I went to GrowthCon in Las Vegas and I wasn't supposed to go to GrowthCon. So I was married at the time and our daughter was a few months old and my wife wanted to go on a girl's trip. And she's like, listen, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable going on a girl's trip unless my mom came down to watch our kid because it's my first time away. I've got mom's guilt, which is 100% fair. No guy will ever understand mother's guilt. No, that's that's like, like real chemical 
yes. balance. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Chemical yeah, yeah. balance, bonding, <laughs> you know. And so I'm like, okay, cool. I, I respect that. But I'm not going to sit in my own house to watch my mother-in-law watch my kid because you don't trust me with my kids. So I said, if we're going to do this, I'm going to find something else to go to. And it happened to be Growth Con in Vegas that wow. same weekend. So I called up my buddy who, and we're like, hey, you want to go to Vegas? Let's go to Growth Con. And I saw Brad Lee talk. And it was the dumbest, best talk ever because it was brush your teeth. It was like, you know, if you're going to be in sales, you know, why are you guys not brushing your teeth? You know, having a mint. And it was just a very simple talk. And when I say it's dumb, it was brilliant, but it was just a simple concept. Yeah. But there was something about Brad's swagger. And I'm like, I want to get to know this guy. And so a few months later, I heard he was starting something called Closer School. I'm like, well, I'll sign up. The very first meeting on Closer School was them sitting at a conference table going, so what do we do? <laughs> and that was five years ago. <laughs> but so I started joining Brad's thing and he found out I, what I was trained in. And his uh, Jenna works with him. Yep. And Jenna said, you really need to meet Janine Driver. I'm like, I don't know who that is. And then Brad had Janine on. She was a total rock star, right? She was she literally was camping with her kids. She was married at the time too. And she drove from the camp spot to somewhere she could get internet to be on closer school and was doing it from her car. You know, Janine, she's all lively and jumping around. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, I love this lady. She's awesome. And uh, then Jenna's like, you need to meet her. And so she connected the two of us and we started talking, but rightfully so. Janine was still hesitant too. And I'm like, well, this is what I do. She's like, okay. She started sending me pictures. I'm like, okay, this, this. And then she went, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. It's not, when she was dating, she'd send me pictures of the guys and she'd tell them ahead of time, I'm going to send this to my friend. I'm like, this is what you have in common. This is what's going to be different. This will be a challenge. <laughs> and so it was kind of like beta testing each other's services. And we became friends over time. And Brad was having an event called Real Success. And I said, I think I'm going to go for this. She goes, as an attendee? I'm like, yeah. She goes, hold on. She calls back. She goes, no, you're going as a speaker. I go, what? She goes, I just told Brad, I'm giving up 15 minutes of my time for you to talk. And that was my first stage ever. Let's go. Yeah. And so. Not only was I, it was a first stage, it was 40 people. My hand shook the entire time. <laughs> but um, I was on stage with uh, Hermosi before he may knew who he was. So I can literally say I was on the same stage as Hermosi, but yeah. you won't remember who I am. <laughs> um, it was Rob Luna, Coach Burt, Brad, Janine, um, Jeff Hoffman, uh, just some amazing people that I'd always wanted to meet. Right? Yeah. And I was, yeah. was going to buy a ticket to be there. Jeff that, Hoffman, Priceline, Jeff yes, Hoffman. Yes, Priceline, yeah. Jeff Hoffman. Um, then there was the uh, guy who was the very first undercover billionaire, Glenn Stearns. So I, I'm sitting in the back, and what's funny is the green room was like this. It was just couches with a red rope, so there was no hiding. Yeah. So we got to meet everyone. It, was, it just changed my life, and I thought, this is what I want to do. Nice. And had Janine not given up her 15 minutes, never would have happened. It's so crazy. it's that, you know, it was seeing Brad, getting to know Brad, Jenna taking the time to say, you need to know Janine. And Janine saying, I will give up my time for Brian. Changed my life. Wow. That's powerful, man. Yeah. It's a powerful story. Um, you had brought something up earlier, hope. So let, let's talk. How do you use yeah. that concept? And how do you, you, you master it, man. You, you, like, how do, how do you do it? T um, tell us how you, how you navigate hope. new relationships and, and use this concept. So, um, Introverts are good at stuff because why we, we think of tools and tactics because it, it wasn't like we're born with, oh, let's go out and just be friendly with people. And so the funniest thing is I'm an introverted extrovert, meaning I'm always, I'm always out, but I don't have to talk to anyone. So like I got here Sunday and there happened to be somebody who's in Steve Sims group with me in the mastermind and she's from Canada. She's like, I'm in Nashville. I'm like, all right. So I went and picked them up and they're like, well, they're out in the middle of like the Burbish area. And I'm like, have you guys not been to Broadway? And they're like, no. I'm like, oh, we're going out. So I took them around, but then they had to leave because they had to drive early. And I just walked around by myself for a couple hours just listening to live music everywhere. Yeah. And I loved people watching, being around, but I didn't talk to a soul. So um, I think introverts come up with good tactics. So uh, like I mentioned before, I've always been a person. If somebody pops to mind, I just send them a text. Um, social media makes it easier to follow up and keep what's going on with people. So I see you post a lot of stuff. I'm like, oh, my friend's posting something. And Sometimes, what if I was the only person to like something or comment on something? And you know it as well as I do. Sometimes putting media out there, you don't get feedback. So I try and put feedback to when I see something somebody's doing. Yeah. And um, like even yesterday, Janine sent me, I didn't see her video on TikTok. She sent me a video of her and she's working with Jesse Itzel. And I'm like, that's awesome. And she's keynoting today in Vegas. Yeah. So it's a, just a matter of, hey, what's going on in your world? Like I said, that's such a simple concept to ask somebody. And then they get to tell you what they want to tell you. So it's not even, a, I saw this on social media, but it lets them fill you in on what's going on in their life. Um, How do you manage all those conversations and stay 
So I up on it because <laughs> you're good at it, man. I'm good. And then here's the funny thing. I hide from other things. Like um, I know right now I just made a to-do list while I was waiting for you to come get me a coffee shop today of people that are business potentials that I haven't followed up with. So I'm good at the relationship side. And I still have that imposter syndrome at times where I hide from the business side of things. Yeah. Um, like when I finally put my coaching together, I didn't pull the trigger for a very long time because I had the, I'm still an apprentice, not the master. But then you have to realize as long as you have more information than the other people, you can still teach other people. Yeah. But I still suffer from imposter syndrome on the business side. So I have friends who are like, hey, send me the info so I can sign up for your course. And I know I haven't sent it to them. And so that's the funny thing is the reason why I'm good at it is because I'm not doing it for gain. I'm doing yes. it for good. And that's that's what makes the difference. If people can tell. Say that one more time. Yeah. I'm not doing it for gain. I'm doing it for good. Yeah. It's because I'm happier when I'm talking to other people. Uh, you talk about isolation. When we all had to live at home. I was going through a separation. Living in a, a you know four-bedroom historic home with just me. And what saved me? Clubhouse. Yeah. Why? Because I could talk to people over, the, you know, when I didn't feel alone. And the other part was we were on this historic street that everybody's walking because they decided you're either we're getting healthier or you're watching uh, Tiger King, right? <laughs> that was about it. But there was like one guy that he started walking and he wouldn't walk very far. He's a really large guy. And then he'd walk a little bit farther, then a little bit farther. And six months into it, he lost 80 pounds because he got his ass off his couch and yeah. started walking. And Last time I saw him before I moved, he'd been down 150 pounds and was having to have the surgery to cut off loose skin. Wow. Because that's how he chose to make his life change. But had I not moved my desk to the front window to look outside like a puppy dog, like, please adopt me at the pet store, right? <laughs> I wouldn't have known those things. But it was that human curiosity about people. Like, I find people fascinating. It's just, you know, there's, you can learn anything from anyone. You can learn what to do or what not to do. But it's from other people. Of course. And... I highly, highly recommend people take NLP. If you've never taken NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, not Natural uh, Language Processing for Computers, but one of the best things that it teaches you is what are the filters you have in place that aren't yours? Meaning, what were you raised or told by somebody else that you make your core belief that you don't really believe? So it teaches you to examine things like that. So when we're raised, don't talk to strangers. You have to talk to strangers for pretty much everything in life. You know, and, oh, well, this person's bad because that, well, are they? Or are they just making the best decision they have at the time? Yeah. So when you learn to take judgment out of things that's not even your judgment that somebody else gave to you, it changes how you see people. I, I, one of the things that happened to me several years back, and a good friend of mine did this, that changed my perspective on a lot of things. I remember this moment. It was late. We were out drinking. We were, I was living in Boston at the time, right on Huntington Ave, and I, we walked to the 7-Eleven to get water. We were like, ugh dehydrated and there was a homeless person that approached us and said hey do you have a dollar mm -hmm. and my friend was like do you have a dollar i need a dollar i'm hungry i'm thirsty yeah and the guy pulls out like 87 cents and is like this is the last 87 cents i have if you need it here you go and he give and the homeless guy gives us who and we were at the club and the yeah. bars right so we're in yeah i, I remember I, I know exactly what i was wearing i was wearing a 295 dollar burberry t-shirt mm -hmm. Right, so we're dressed up. I had I had black shoes on, two hundred pair dollar pair of shoes, yeah. and this guy gives us eighty seven his last eighty seven cents, and that moment changed a lot for me because I was judging that guy that he was a bad person, a piece of shit, made a bunch of mistakes, a drug addict, an alcoholic. All those things could have been true at mm -hmm. some point, but in that moment, my experience at three four in the morning with my best friend in Mission Hill, Boston, walking into the 7-Eleven was a mind shift for me because that was a good person. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we gave him his 87 cents back. We said, come into 7-Eleven and fill up as much stuff as you can grab and we're buying it for you. Yeah. And here's the best part about that story. Do you think he filled up every pocket? No. No. Just enough to get by. Just enough to, in his two hands. I, and I was like, man, like, get more, you yeah. know, like, I, I'm like, you just blew my fucking mind. Like, like, and, and he's like, I'm good. And, and it's just those little things in life that stick with you and, and, and just completely give you a paradigm shift. Yeah. I mean, wild. My ex does this good. She carries uh, protein bars and waters in her car. If she sees somebody who's asking for money, she'll say, hey, do you want these things? If she turns them down, then she knows they're not in it for the food or the substance or anything. 
it's a money making scheme. Yep. Um, I ran across this in uh, in the inverse story. I was home one day and there was a lady sitting outside. It was starting to rain. It was cold, and I'm like, I got a sleeping bag. Why am I letting this lady sit out homeless? So I went. I gave her the sleeping bag and I gave her like twenty bucks in ones, and. It was ironic because I saw her a week later and I didn't see the sleeping bag. And my first reaction was like, see, I know I shouldn't have done that. And I thought, yeah, but maybe she bartered for something else that she needed. Or maybe she gave it to somebody who needed it more than her. Yeah. So we're so quick to judge. We want to be understood, but we're quick to judge other people. And that's the funny thing about it is it's, you can't have it both ways. If you're going to judge someone else, then you should be judged by that same thing. Not ask for grace and then judge everybody else. Totally. Yeah. Totally. So powerful. Man, that just hits. I, I'm just I'm running through so many situations, and 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 I'm I'm bringing it back to building relationships. It's mm -hmm. like, and what I'm going to talk about today is active listening. Yes, like listen actively, not think about what you're going to say and what you need mm -hmm. and what filter or what bias or what experience you've had, and give mm -hmm. gratitude and give grace. So we talk about this with sales teams a lot. It's okay to have a script, but the script is just to get you into a conversation, not to control the conversation. And that's where most young salespeople make a mistake is, hi, my name is John Smith. I hope you are doing well today. Okay. You know, it's a script is just how do you get in, get started? Yeah. And it, a lot of people need it, right? It's no different than actors, but what happens with acting is then they throw in lines that, they, that also make the thing. And so that's what I was, Nicole Kramer was talking about this recently oh really? okay. with scripts. Mm -hmm. Like when you have a script in a movie, everybody knows the script though. Yes. So it's different than me trying to sell you something and you don't have a script. When she was talking, when Nicole was saying this last week, I was yeah. like, blew my mind because it's so important. And then the other piece of it was, well, in the great movies, if you go back and you listen to those pivotal monumental parts yes they ad lib or they went off hawk or they just yes. flew and they said oh i was going with the energy or i had this feeling or mm -hmm. sorry i went off script and it becomes like the cut yes. the piece right so so it's exactly what you're talking about yeah, yeah. exactly what you're saying uh, you were asking earlier and I, I forgot to answer your question like what are janine and i doing now so because she'll be here next month so we have a course called read the face read the room and that is how do i prepare to go in for the presentation you know am i looking is it auditory kinesthetic a visual and then once you're in the room then use all janine's tactics to well, i say tactics all of her skills right because when you say tactics people go oh um, of reading body language to know what's going on while you're in the presentation so read the face read the room what do i need to do to win the rfp everything else to get in the room how can i prepare to be in the room and then once I'm in the room, what should I be paying attention to at the exact same time? Let's go. I'm excited for that one. Oh, yeah. that's And if you've never had the pleasure of seeing Janine live, like, it's a whole other level, yeah. right? Like, you almost had to have the old uh, movies or the old comedy show where they pull off the hook and have to pull her off stage. Because once <laughs> she gets going, she gets going. I had know? to do it at our conference. <laughs> yeah, exactly I was right. like, they're going to literally charge me five grand if you don't get off in the next yeah. two minutes. <laughs> and I'm not paying it. Right. Well, they charged me that anyway, yeah. but that's a different story. But that's um, how she is, right? She just wants to give when she's up there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, uh, let's wrap up with one last question. Sure. We've got to hit this mastermind we got coming up, and then mm -hmm. we've got the live event today. The next 12 months for you, mm -hmm. how do you plan to create the most impact? Coaching. Uh, you know, like we talked about before, speaking is just like reaching out, hoping something lands. Uh, I've got some in Canada that are coming up. So like I'm nice. getting some more international gigs. That's going to be more fun. But Does Canada pay just as good as the U.S.? It does. But I, I'm kind of thinking I'm like, but do they, am I getting a discount? Because I'm they're paying me in U.S. dollars <laughs> versus the other one. I didn't think about that. Thanks. I appreciate that, Jim. <laughs> I, I was in a mastermind. We were talking about worldwide speaking last week. So that's why I was that's asking. That's a good question. I do know it's at a really nice resort in Alberta, Canada. So I'm cool with it. I'm like, all right, I'm going to make a vacation out of this one. The, these were really experienced speakers who have been doing this for seven, eight, you know, one guy, 20 years, you know, getting paid 25K to up to 75K for a 45-minute speech. And yeah. He's, it, it was interesting because this type of conversation was the real raw truth. Yes. A lot of it had to stay in that room, mm -hmm. which I'm like, see, this is what I need, right? Yes. As an aspiring speaker and growing, uh, to say the least. But they were talking about, you know, it's cute when you post how you're over in Europe and you're in Spain and you're doing all this and you're speaking. But mm -hmm. 
the reality of it is, is oftentimes you're making pennies. Yes. And oftentimes a big piece of it is just the travel. So if you don't double up, meaning like bring the family and go have an experience after, yeah. or, you know, get a good chunk of cash to go do it, then you typically will come back feeling like that was draining and, you know, there was a lot of travel because, you know, you're jumping a couple flights and then mm -hmm. transportation and all that stuff. So I just thought that was interesting. So let's... But anyways, back to what you were saying. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, I, I, let's talk about that for a minute because I think there's going to be a lot of people who think travel is glorious. I've been traveling for 22 years, um, 21 years as corporate America, a year and a half as a speaker. And everybody thinks it's glorious travel until they go to the airport and they forget about flight delays. I swear plane yeah. maintenance is more and more. Uh, flight attendants don't like their jobs a lot of times because passengers have become a-holes. Yep. Like it's a lot of wasted time. It's a lot of draining time. Like a lot of times I'll get on a flight. I'll come home. I'll take a nap when I get to the hotel. So sometimes is it fun? Yes. A lot of times is it draining? Yes. Yes. And that's the funny thing is it looks good on social media. That's great. But that's not the reality of how it always is. It is a, the reason why it pays well is because it, it takes a lot out of you. Like if you have a one day speaking gig, well, but you got flying the day before, you know, so you're not late. And then a lot of times you may stay over for that dinner. So you're really missing three days. So you're paid And you well. got to prep. Yes. You got to read the room. You got to exactly. understand how you could speak directly to the consumer, that audience, mm -hmm. that whatever industry, whatever yes. they need most based right. on what the host has said. Things change. It, it's a lot of prep. It and is. I think people don't understand that. And then mm -hmm. to your point, like with the travel, you know, I had to tell my wife and I, and I say tell, but that wasn't actually the case. I asked my wife, are you cool with me pursuing this career? Mm -hmm. And like with a one-year-old, it was fun. And now it's like she doesn't want to travel because right. it's harder with one and a half-year-old. So 100%. it's like I'm in it now where it's it's the waves of like excitement and then, oh, you're going away again. Uh -huh. Oh, you're in New York. You came back. You went to this conference. You flew here. You spoke, in, you spoke here. You're back. Oh, and you have an event next week. Mm -hmm. It's like, whoa, that's a lot of pressure. I wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't for my ex-wife being a really good co-parent. So she travels from time to time. She's only recently started traveling again with her job, but she'll go on trips. Like she's going to go do a yoga uh, retreat somewhere. Yeah. And so we try and work on co-parenting of who can watch kids. I'll tell you the one thing that's different about our age range versus if it would have been 20, 30 years ago, FaceTime. FaceTime is the it's most huge. important thing when you have a young kid because you still get to see them. They don't understand audio phone calls really. Like they hear your voice and looking around, yeah. kind of like your dogs, right? Like, like they hear something, but yep. you know, they don't know where yep. you're at. Oh, uh, yeah. But FaceTime can, is the next closest thing to actual connection. Yep. So when I'm gone, I try and call my daughter every time or every night just to check in, even if it's for two seconds to see that face. So important. Instead of making a phone call. So important. Yeah. And so that's the, we at least have modern technology, but you're right. It's, it's a tough life when it's the best problem to have to get to choose. Do I want to do this while being away from my family, but for the greater good? But sometimes it, it breaks on your heart. Like, you know, luckily I, I have been in the two years I've been doing this, I haven't had to miss anything pivotal. Yeah. No dance recitals, anything like that. But I was with Nick yesterday and Nick said somebody invited him out to something. He's like, I got to check my, my son's uh, baseball things first. I'm not missing a game for a gig. I'm like, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Brian Covey taught me that mm -hmm. last year. Yeah. We had a conversation and, and he's like, I can't just talk about who I am. Mm -hmm. I need to show up and do it. Cause yes. I was asking him like, how many gigs are you doing? He's like, I'm only doing seven or eight. Yeah. That's it. And it can't be around kids and sports and soccer. And I was like, it's admirable. Yeah. Cause he's got a full-time job running the, yeah. the agency as well. I was just Craig Ballantyne, yeah. same thing. He was going to speak at my conference in 2023. Yeah. And he's like, we got another kid on the way. I can't leave for four days. Exactly. And I'm like, and, and he, we had contract and everything like yeah. it was ready to go. We yeah. agreed on the money and I was like, wow, that's so powerful. Like for my first reaction was like, what the fuck? Yeah. The business side of you. I was <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. Right. Cause, cause more work, find someone else, you know, it's stressful. Mm -hmm. We negotiated. Craig's yeah. a great guy. So he understood why we were doing it. And, and right. So like, that was a win for me. I'm not yeah. going to lie Yeah. for him to do it at what we finalized it at. I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do this again with someone else. Like right. he believed in it. He saw the impact pun intended. 
Um, but I took a step back and was like, wow, that's actually, I actually needed to hear that in that moment. It was more important for him to send me that reminder for me to look in the mirror internally to not make those mistakes than it was for me to have to go hire someone and maybe not get it at the price that's at his level that aligns with the conference. Right. But it was important for my personal life. I needed to hear that because it was actually, I was in three different cities that week. There's... And I was drained mm -hmm. and I didn't give my wife enough credit for it, for spending the week and working yeah. and raising our daughter oh, yeah. that she deserved. And it's hard. So when I was married, the same thing was if you're going to events, well, even in corporate America, you got to go out with your teammates, you got to go out with customers. And so they see you going out to these nice dinners and things. It's like, well, but I'm still gone regardless, yeah. you know, but sometimes that's just as draining. Like when I used to have to go to corporate trade shows, we'd have to work the booth all day and then take customers out all night. It was exhausting. Yeah. So you're working like 16 hour days and you're hanging out with people that don't get me wrong, they're nice, but they're not your first choice of who you'd go and hang out with, but it's a necessary exactly. evil. And then you come home exhausted and you can't give back to the people who are supporting you so you can do these things. And that was something I didn't learn until therapy after, you know, when going through the divorce. Yeah. Yeah. It's important. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's wrap this thing up, man. Yeah. We got a mastermind. Right, we so got a full day to go. <laughs> coaching. You yes. guys working on some stuff. Collaboration. Yep. One on one coaching, group coaching. Where can, where can they find you? Everything is subtle skills. Cool. But what I learned is nobody can spell subtle. So if you go to getthecheatsheet.com, that's how people can go and get the cheat sheet to download the different eyebrows. And everything else. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Of course. Such Thank a great having. conversation, man. As always.